Hi everyone, thank you for watching the East Village Queer Film Festival presented by Wild Project. Uh, you just finished watching our short program, New Shorts with Big Hearts. My name is Kyle Glasso and I'll be moderating tonight's q and I'm very, very happy to be joined by writer and director of Next Level Shit, Gary Jaffe. <laughs> Welcome. And from the film What If, co-stars David Farrington and Buck Angel. Yay. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having us. It's so great. Thank you for joining me. Um, so first off, I would love to just thank you um, and commend you each for these films. Um, I'm so impressed by the way that each film casts a light on these very intimate moments, um, intimate moments within the queer within queer culture that I think many of us experience but haven't yet seen represented in film and so it's exciting to just see forward thinking come through in your work um so thank you um and if you have any comments feel free to just jump in um but without further ado um i'd like to start off by hearing what compelled each of you to tell these stories through your film. Um, what if, do you want to kick it off? Uh, sure, but I, I think we need <laughs> to talk about Francisco's vision. Um, yes. Francisco, who, who we lost uh, recently, it was the writer director of What If? And um, sorry, it's so emotional. Um, he, he actually, as a filmmaker, attended a Q&A for a film that, that he was doing at a film festival. And there was a man on the panel that he thought was really attractive uh, and found out later that it was a transgender man. And then suddenly had these feelings of, oh, would I still have been attracted to that person had I known? And what does it matter? I still thought the person was attractive. So the whole kind of idea of what if was born out of Francisco's actual experience as a gay man wondering if he could date a trans man. Uh, and I think that he, he had a beautiful message that, uh, about our capacity as human beings to love and to take information and assimilate it and have paradigm shifts in the way we think and make ourselves better. Uh, as individuals and for a society. And this, I think, is what the film means to everyone that was involved with it. It's a beautiful film. Um, and my condolences to Francisco Huertas' family and loved ones. Um, very unfortunate that he can't be here with us. Um, I, Gary, on your, I'm sorry, David, on your website, um, you have sort of a behind the scenes video with uh, Francisco and he gets to, to discuss um, his thoughts on the film and we get a glimpse behind the scenes. That was a really exciting peek behind the curtain. Um, so thank you for having that on your website and available. I think oh, you're welcome, thank you. I'm so happy that, that you got something from it. it it's, I, I didn't want um, Francisco's voice to leave this world with him and that's why uh, when we heard about it, I created that kind of sub page on my website for him. It's a beautiful tribute. Thank you. Um, so the inspiration for Next Level Shit uh, came from a really bad night in December, 2013, when I had was traveling back from Williamsburg to uh, Manhattan, where I had just moved to New York and was staying with my aunt. And I'd eaten a bad burger or something and it uh, uh, had a gastrointestinal emergency, and I did not quite make it to the toilet. So there I was, <laughs> at, uh, having sharp my pants, and my aunt being like, are you okay? And I'm like, give me a minute. Um, thinking, gosh, I feel so vulnerable right now. I feel so vulnerable. This well, I should make a movie about this. Um, but what I'm always interested in like pushing into more vulnerable spaces with laughter, if possible, 
that that help us see like well what are our real fears and our real anxieties about life as as queer people or even as uh in this particular case just people who do sex things with butts um because mm -hmm. as i was sitting there on that toilet i thought to myself you know this also reminds me of like the anxiety i feel whenever you know i'm performing the penetrated role in anal sex and i the anxiety i hear from friends of mine the extreme lengths that people go to and i thought to myself you know maybe we can uh maybe we can summon a demon and exercise it a little bit with a with a nice convenient 12 minute three act structure. Um, so I, I took those feelings of vulnerability, um, recruited Ben Bauer, who I met at a film festival in 2017, and, uh, and put together something that would keep you laughing until you go, oh, oh. But ideally deliver a rather sweet message that love comes from the shit, not in spite of it. Um, despite being something of a, of a hard to watch movie in some moments, I don't consider myself an abusive director. I really consider myself a loving director, but I do know that I, we need to go through that shit together to like get to the other side of it. Totally. I think that's the beauty of humor is um, being able to make the, the, the difficult, challenging, vulnerable moments mm -hmm. much um, easier to overcome or yeah. rise, and, rise from. It never hurts to have the, the ta talented and extremely handsome Daniel K. Isaac, you know, look at you with eyes that say, you're fine, you're okay. Everyone yeah. <laughs> has a Daniel K. Isaac in their life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Buck, what drew you to um, the film and, and where, what was your sort of in point, like what, um, what was the, the, the piece of it yeah. that hooked you? Well, the whole thing, well, the whole thing hooked me. Francisco reached out, to, I'm not an actor, that's not, you know, my space, and acting is a skill, <laughs> David. You're, you're amazing, Buck, stop. And <laughs> so I, I'm up. not comfortable acting, it's not my space, I'm very open about that, but I got the opportunity to do this film, and more for me and my activism, because more I'd say my space is activism in the world. And mm. um, so I saw this film as truly activism in a way, because through my work in the sexual adult entertainment field, you know, I've had many uh, biological or cisgender gay men come after me. And then once they found out I was, you know, female or had female anatomy that I used to be, it freaked these guys out. So this, this film really resonated with me in a way that when I, you know, started to date men, this happened to me where they would freak out. And when they found out I used to be a female or that I still, you know, had, female anatomy, that it just became a nightmare for me. It was uncomfortable. So that really was one of the things that hooked me into this film, because as you see the transgender community grow, and as it grows specifically in the trans male field, uh, lots of trans men are becoming attracted to, you know, cisgender men and cis gay men are becoming attracted to us, at, but we don't mm -hmm. talk about it. And it's a very sort of, I became a dirty little secret on some level. And so Francisco saw this, as you see what David said, it happened to him and it started happening to more gay men becoming attracted to trans men. And so I think in a nutshell, this film, what we'll do is it will hopefully alleviate that shame that shame where I'm attracted, which is such a weird place for us to even be in as sexual beings. Like you're allowed, even if you're gay, <laughs> whatever that, you know, you can be attracted to people, which has been the overall part of my message. Attraction mm -hmm. is to people. It's not to gender. It's not to, you know, sexual. It's to actually that person. So I think the film hopefully will help people see what attraction is and that we have to stop limiting this idea just because I'm a gay man. And it doesn't not make you a gay man to be attracted to a guy like me or to be even attracted to a cisgender woman. It might just be that space. But I think what it will hopefully do is alleviate this idea that you have to have shame around your own attractions, even if you identify a certain way. So I'm very proud of this film. And, you know, like David said, he's going to cry. I'm going to cry too, because we <laughs> lost Francisco. I can't even believe it. I can't. Like, it just I happened. I almost couldn't even fast. do this Q&A because I knew I was going to be so upset. It uh. happens so fast. That man is a genius. <laughs> I 
think more than anything, um, having festivals screen this movie will make Francisco so proud of what he's done and bringing a message to the world that, you know, you can just love anybody you want to love. And that's really the message. So, you know, <laughs> this conversation that we're having about, about throwing labels and expectations out reminds me of a pretty transformative talk back I went to with Kate Bornstein, the mm -hmm. Kate Bornstein. Wow. <laughs> this was back in 2007, I don't know, maybe 2008. And um, I was a junior in college and I'd been a couple years out of the closet at that point, maybe four. And I remember there was a point where Kate asked us, said, okay, so who here identifies as gay? And it was sort of like a cool moment of, of, of public identification and felt proud about it. And then she looked and she said, why? And it was this moment of like, because here, you know, I grew up in, in Texas, you know, it was, I was the only gay person at my school. It, it felt pretty revol like revolutionary to be gay. And then to have Kate be like, mm -mm. see, that's actually still like a fairly narrow way of looking at it because like there's all these other things. And really like you've taken one label off and put another label on, um, which is, you know, p power to you if that's what you want, but like, let's interrogate this. And then when she concluded her, uh, her, her spiel with like, you know, I'm, uh, you know, a, a, a trans woman who's attracted to other women and my, my wife is now transitioning to become a man. Does that make me a straight woman? <laughs> yeah. So this conversation that what if is, is provoking really, you know, makes me think about that. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 It, it sounds like both of our films um, are helping people sort of realize that we put that stigma on ourselves from, through this push that we have from even our own communities, right? Our own communities shove us into these. I can say in the trans world today, we're really having this insurgence of really policing language, of policing our own identities, how we're supposed to be trans, what is trans. And so th these movies, I think ours and yours, we really can help people to see that it's all about you. <laughs> when we look at cultural models for like gay folks or, or queer folks in general, like it's either porn or it's like broke right. back mountain, you know, or That's it's right. like some of these conversations that start to happen like amongst friends, but even then like, um, wait, you don't douche? What? I douche for two hours, three hours. It's like, oh my God, like th the cultural models are not helping. <laughs> <laughs> so it, has, has anyone ever read the uh, original Torch Song Trilogy play? Because this line got edited out of the movie and it's fantastic where um, he turns, <laughs> the young lover turns to the Harvey Firestein character and says, what's this black shit on the pillow? What black shit on the pillow? This, oh, that's black shit on the pillow. Like it's true. <laughs> Well, that's why I, I think that both of your both of these films and many of the films um, throughout the the festival this week um, really help to destigmatize a lot of these um, conversations or dynamics within the LGBTQ community that I think many of us within the community are often uncertain of like um, how to talk about something or are scared to open up about something. And so films like yours, I think, really help to open that door. These films are not pornographic, but what they do is they give people an idea of their own self. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it really is. When you first saw the first gay man, right? You're like, oh, wow, this is so awesome in a TV show or whatever. Like, we're just experimenting in the trans male world to the rest of the world with our sexuality and showing ourselves on screen and being out there. And so really, sex is a really important part of life. I believe that. I believe it's the reason I'm the person I am today because I became sexually okay with my own body. And that alleviated a lot of dysphoria, a lot of the stuff I had. So when we help people leave these painful spaces of I'm in love with other men or I wanna have sex with other men, when we alleviate that, it really actually helps the world. When I was approaching the film in that scene that I have with Mama Mickey with the fabulous Debbie Troche uh, in the kitchen, I, I approached the role and read this dialogue going, no, these are real serious thoughts that this man is having and the, the identity crisis that he is grappling with. And I was recently trying to re-edit footage for my demo reel and the woman that was helping me edit, I said, I, I wanna use more of that scene. I think it's a great scene. And she says, you actually say terrible things about trans people. And I went, maybe it's not the best to use. And I stopped and I thought about it and I was like, 
you know, as somebody who is coming from an honest perspective of how would I approach this in my own life, I'm like, you know what, those are really are terrible things to say, but it's what we think about. I don't see people out there on the street calling me a weird tranny, weirdo, fag, whatever, you know what I mean? They don't see that. But if we put it in films, right, and we mimic these real life experiences, people could actually see, wow, like gay people have to go out of the house every day and be in a fear of some kind of situation or, you know what I mean? Like we also mm -hmm. have to fear for certain things just because I'm a, I look like a man and I, you know, walk this way, things can still happen to me as a trans guy. It's so people... important for film to sort of carry that same visibility so that people can use movies and TV shows or podcasts even um, as beacons of like helping, helping guide them forward, you know, instead of just staying stagnant. I think it's um, important to do that in, in macro ways and in micro ways. Like one thing that's tiny in the movie, but I think is important and people have reacted to is we deliberately don't show you Chris's face until Daniel opens the door. This was a conversation. We should, should we hit, hit pop up on the phone so we can see him? And I thought, no, no, no. Let's have him just be this voice, this kind of like bro -y voice so that the, the audience develops a picture in their head of who they think this person is. And then when handsome, talented, charming Daniel K. Isaac opens the door, you had this, <gasps> and then and a, a lot of people said like, you know, I had to catch myself because I did not anticipate seeing an Asian American there. Point is like, <laughs> how can we as, as queer creators who are putting forth content that hopefully queer and beyond audiences are going to see, how can we torpedo, you know, toxic ideas, both in the broad subject matter of our movies and in like the minutia, because it all matters and it all adds up. I think more than ever film festivals like this are so important because they still let us have hope. <laughs> that, that we'll have hope to make change. And the only way you make change is by having conversation. I'm a big believer of that. And if we, even if the conversation okay. hurts, even if it the conversation to. is transphobic or homophobic or whatever, if we don't have these hard, hard conversations, we're never, we're always going to be marginalized as an LGBTQ community because we're not having a conversation in, see, we don't need to be having little, even though these little film festivals are very, very important, we need to have these film festivals put out there for the rest of the world to see because we're sort of speaking to each other, if that makes sense, right? I think that's what's wonderful about this virtual platform. Yeah, we need to get the rest yeah. of the world in here. That's what I'm hoping to do, is not get my queer friends in this, but to get the people outside of the queer community to see these films because I think then they will have an understanding of why it's not okay to call somebody a tranny or why it's not okay to say faggot every, every other word. <laughs> not much a queer community off for, for our own need to like be foisting these conversations on ourselves. Uh, um, I, I was lucky enough to screen my first short film Sunset with East Village Queer Film Festival uh, two years ago. And that's on YouTube. And so I get all these like funny comments, uh, mostly, mostly very, very positive, which is such a nice thing. But one comment that sticks out is um, the opening moment is like a drag queen fucking a boy who's about to go off to war. Like, like, and I deliberately did that. I was like, you know what? The more obvious thing would be like the soldier boy at the top, uh, so on and so forth. And this guy commented like, these two femmes don't generate any chemistry. Don't you know that opposites attract? And I resisted commenting response like, wow, what a limited sexual imagination you have. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but maybe I will, maybe, maybe yeah, I'll. We yeah, always yeah. pick ourselves apart more than any, there's one scene in our thing and I cut a little trailer and put it on and it was uh, me, uh, David and I at the bar getting a drink. And then, you know, David ordered some queenie drink. What did you order? <laughs> I forgot, like cosmopolitan. <laughs> and then That's I'm one like, of my favorite lines. I'm having a beer. And then he changes it. And then, he, you know, remember you were like very, very flamboyant in your- the queen can I'm change his royal mind. That's right. Yeah. So then of course, <laughs> some gay guy was like, I'm so sick and tired of these stereotypes of gay men, blah, blah. I go, but it's real. <laughs> and that man has probably made that joke himself. Exactly. I swear by the playbills on my wall that I am a flamboyant gay man. Excellent. I love fun home. Yeah. See how they were shaming though. You have to within our own within our own communities we shame each other. How can we stand up? 
to someone like Trump and, and say, no, we deserve marriage equality at the very least if we're fighting within amongst ourselves about what to call people. And I'm sorry, the name you call me is nothing. I could care less what you call me, just respect me. Yeah. The, and the language is very powerful. I mean, even just tracking the, tracking the the acronym, the alphabet soup, I remember uh, st how it began as GLBT and then yes. switched to LGBT. And now yeah. I don't even think of twice about that. And that's very powerful. It's yes. very powerful because like it, 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 it uh, confirms how like cis gay men tend to assert power in, in the situations in the spaces that we right. live in based on you know our male pr privilege. And maybe by like having G first, that's just reaffirming that. So now that the L first comes first, like, and that it's not even, that's, that's the terminology, that's a shift. And, it, and, and it's something that, uh, that conveys power beyond what you might think like a simple rearrangement of letters would be. And so the more that we can do that, the more that we can, you know, acknowledge where even we within the marginalized community have power where others don't and try to like give space, give time, make stories and make visibility like the better. And I guarantee you that most L L's and G's have at one point in their life when they were discovering their own sexuality, even yeah. without terminology to talk about it, wondered if they were transgender. That's right. I remember when I was a kid and I, there, what, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, the word transgender, at least, you know, to my, you know, 12 year old brain was, did not exist. Mm -hmm. And I remember literally thinking, wait, do I want to be a woman because I like men? I, it wasn't talked about. Yeah, there does seem to be a sort of this mass awakening, not just within the, the LGBTQ community, but I think, you know, amongst racial groups and just all of the world coming to terms with a lot of the invisible issues that have been happening, in, invisible to um, anyone who's sort of outside the community. And so I think, um, sort of tying everything together this film festival is really it's such a gem <laughs> to be able to give back to the queer community and and the allies who actually participate in watching these films to just give some more insight and depth and humility and vulnerability to the queer experience um and so when you were when you're all working um when you were working on your films was there a lot of collaboration that went into the development um leading up to to shooting um can you speak a little about that experience um gary i off, i forced them to go first last time so Please. i'll go first this time. um absolutely i uh I conceptualized this basic story several years ago um but then uh, as i was on the the film festival circuit with sunset um, I started pondering, well, what's the next one? And I wanted it to be the story that would become Next Level Shit, although it had different titles back then, including like Southbound Train and Butt Stuff <laughs> and various other titles. Um, but it didn't really come vividly into, into view until I met Ben and I realized I have met the perfect gay who should shit himself. Um, and so I, I pitched it to Ben on a Providence rooftop um, and then delivered him a first draft of the script maybe about a month later. And what was interesting is in that pitch, um, I had said basically it's a Trojan horse. It's like scatological gross out comedy until it's like deeply heartfelt and personal. And because my, my default is to write drama, um, I, I kind of overdid it on the scatological comedy in the script. And Ben responded, he's like, you know, this is getting there, but I feel like I'm missing the vulnerable, intimate thing that you, that you say the movie is actually about. So can you do it again and, and give me that? And I was like, you mean write the movie that I probably know how to write if I'm just following my, my true muse? I can do that. I can make it more dramatic. I can make it more intimate. Um, and so that really helped transform the script to this, you know, very tight, just enough poop um, uh, thing <laughs> that it is. Um, and then, of course, uh, there were some very interesting conversations throughout. Uh, one that was fairly amusing with regards to the amount of shittiness is that my editor, um, who was raised a good Christian girl uh, uh, in New Jersey, said, I don't think you need the shit shot. I think it's going to turn people off. I think you can do it with the sound. And I was like, mm. and then my 
colorist who's a straight man was like, what if you just stared at it? Like, just like really gave it to them. And I was like, you're both wrong. We need to see it because it needs, we need to know just how bad it was. We need to have that. <laughs> and we cannot stare at it because that is abusive. So what we're going to do is exactly what Ben does in the shot. He's going to glance down at it and the cameras go, uh, and, then we're, and then we're off and then it's over. But, but ev uh, it's such a bummer we don't get to watch it in person together because people go, they go <laughs> yeah. at that moment. My favorite love love reaction <laughs> though sorry, uh, is um, this was in Dayton, Ohio as Ben's stomach is gurgling and his face goes, as we get the, the this reaction shot, that moment, um, <laughs> this woman yelled out of the audience, next level shit. <laughs> <laughs> if they are yelling the name of the movie, we must be doing something. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. Um, and David and Buck, can you speak a little about the uh, development and pre-production leading into um, shooting your film? Um, was it very, was there a lot of discussion and collaboration leading up to it? Pre-production, uh, Francisco, he, he reached out to me and then I said, dude, I'm not an actor. I don't, <laughs> it's not my space. I don't, you know, give it to a trans guy who really wants to act. And th I think we did the film two or three years ago, didn't we? Did we 2017 that? Memorial yeah. Day weekend. Right. So there wasn't really a lot of talk about trans actors as much as there is today uh, more. And there just wasn't anybody. He really wanted me for the part. So I met, I think, a couple of days before the, well, we talked over the phone. And he just wanted to get really, like, more realistic uh, you know, verbiage. He wanted to have words correct or how this person would act in this situation. So, you know, on some level, we really used my experiences of having. And we were, I was talking to Buck, and he's the one who said, yeah, you know, in a way, uh, trans men are invisible. He says, because, you know, because we were saying that a trans woman, sometimes, you know, you can tell. Mm -hmm. But with a trans man, very difficult. And that's what it's so now he literally let me sort of free flow, which was okay. I think yeah, which was, was great really to work great. off of because you never uh, you know for me I I knew like the idea that was going to be coming out of yeah. your mouth, but I never knew what words I was going to be right. hearing and responding to. Yeah, and so it just kept I think David so fresh. and I just clicked. We just we clicked. I don't. Oh, I, I miss very you so honest. much, Buck. I know I miss you too. <laughs> we had such a great time shooting. I think it's the perfect time for this film to be shown. There's just so much trans stuff being happening right now and i think people need to talk more we need to talk i've been trying so hard to get people to talk about sex in the trans <laughs> community and it's a very very hard space to do that so you know i think this will open that that conversation up uh, yeah there is something very magical about just opening yourself up and allowing others that you're collaborating with to open themselves up and yeah. whether they have experience or not just their passion um, allowing their passion to drive them and being able to work in that. Real. So do, you, do any of you have anything new that you're working on now? Um, and where can any listener follow you on social media or stay in touch with your work? Okay, you go first. Option, go, Gary. Um, yeah. So uh, I have a new short film that's just on the festival circuit now, and that's called Last Summer with Uncle Ira which is a love letter to my uncle Barry, who died of AIDS when I was three in 1991. Oh, wow. It imagines what if a kid like me were 16 in the summer of 91 instead of three and had the chance to have some conversations with him that I didn't get to have. Um, and that short is a, is a proof of concept for a feature film, which my team and I are hopefully moving toward making. And the big news on that is that Last Summer with Ira, which is the feature, is going to be one of the 2020 Outfest Screenwriting Lab fellow projects. So like- Congratulations. Oh, awesome, dude, forward, awesome. Trying to make it happen. So, uh, so keep a keep lookout for that. And if you want to follow me on social media, I post writer selfies and occasional thirst traps on at, at Gary S. Jaffe uh, on Instagram. Um, that's at Gary S. Jaffe. Mostly me with like mugs writing, sometimes me with my shirt off, which is kind of a new thing. I wasn't really comfortable doing that. So like, why not? It's 2020. Why not? Fuck it. <laughs> it's COVID. Do it. Right. <laughs> David? 
Uh, yeah, David? so um, all of, I'm mostly on Facebook. I have Instagram and Twitter, but I'm hardly ever on them. Uh, I get overly political if you want to follow that on Facebook. <laughs> uh, it's all it's all David M. Farrington. Uh, it's all kind of congregated on my website. It's davidmfarrington.com, um, where you can see those behind the scenes clips that you were talking about, Kyle, and, and a lot of other stuff. Um, in terms of what's coming up, um, I'm so happy that production has safely started reopening in COVID. Uh, at the beginning of August, I shot a short film called Company Retreat. Uh, the trailer is a, a thriller. The, the trailer is now out, but they're still finishing up post-production. Um, I just two weeks ago shot an episode of The Food That Built America. So if you have History Channel, keep an eye out on that next, next season. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's going on and you know, just auditioning and hitting the grind and trying to survive these days so gary if you need any talent for that upcoming uh film you know where to <laughs> right on. If you need a gray beard daddy give me a call <laughs> right on. But, so, so i am just doing my activism which is so insane <laughs> the world has lost its mind but um, i'm also in the cannabis business and i created the first lgbt focused cannabis company in california called pride wellness you can follow oh. Pride Wellness LA on Instagram. So that's been, I, I'm the first trans owned all LGBT cannabis company. So that's been pretty amazing. And I give back money to the LGBT community here in Los Angeles to the senior centers specifically for seniors, because if you're not gonna believe this, we have homeless gay seniors. How is what? that possible? Yes, no. lots of them, lots of no. them, it's disgusting, yeah. So. I, that, I'm working on my cannabis because I believe in it as a medication and working towards helping our community become a little bit more healthier without using, you know, pharmaceutical. I'm not a big pharmaceutical person. So um, I also create sexual wellness products and I have a whole new line of sexual wellness products for trans men. I created the first trans male uh, sex toys uh, to help people really, you know, connect to their bodies. So those are my two major focuses right now. And just really being out there and, you know, trying to help the world heal. We're just in such a, it's a very sad space. And you can follow me on Instagram, Buck Angel, Twitter, Buck Angel. Uh, don't do Facebook much because it's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, I avoid Facebook too. <laughs> it's so creepy. It's so mean. I swear to God. You want to go have a good beat? You want to go get beat up? Go on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all again so much for being here. Gary, right thank on. you. And David and Buck, thank, thank you, you so much for honoring Francisco by being here. Um, yeah. Right on. yeah. Um, so that's going to wrap up tonight's Q&A. Thanks again to all of our filmmakers from tonight's program. And thank you for watching. Um, you can catch the rest of the festival, which continues through Sunday, October 11th, by visiting our website at thewildproject.org. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.